All right, welcome back to the program. In case you're just joining us, welcome. And don't forget to go to our social media platforms. The handles will be put on the screen shortly. Dr. Bongrad is joining us right now. He is uh, a lecturer at the Lagos Business School. But before we go to Dr. Bongradi, let's quickly, Dr. Bongradi, I'm seeing you, but let's quickly take a break. And when we come back, I will be coming over to you. Hello, YouTubers. Welcome to Moneyline with Nancy TV YouTube channel. This is where we provide you with instructive business directions, processes, and guidance to help you assess the right resources to fund your businesses to withstand every form of internal and external shock. You will find here awesome informative videos on business, entrepreneurship, and lifestyle just to help you make informed business and financial decisions. Punch the subscribe button and let us drive you through the world of business. Please follow all our social media platforms on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and follow us for latest updates on our website. All right, welcome back. Dr. Bongo Adi is joining me right now from Lagos via Skype. Hello, Dr. Adi. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. Nice to be with you this nice. afternoon. Uh, nice to be with you, uh, too. Let's talk about uh, the international flight resumption uh, some, uh, that's on Saturday. Uh, we will see that international flights will resume. At least some airlines will come into Nigeria and also leave uh, Nigeria. How do you think this would impact uh, businesses uh, in Nigeria, especially businesses around travel, hospitality? Um, uh, yes, travel, hospitality, um, what are the airline business and all of that? What's your recovery uh, projection 
for some of these businesses as international flights resume tomorrow. Not just even those businesses, there are some other businesses that are indirectly linked to these businesses that I've mentioned. Oh, yes, thank you very much. I think you're speaking about the aviation uh, value chain, yeah. Um, and I think they've been the, uh, one of the worst hits, actually the worst hits uh, during this uh, lockdown. Because um, one of, in fact, the first thing that most countries did um, at the onset of the coronavirus pandemic was to, um, you know, stop all um, flights, both incoming and outgoing, uh, both outward and inward bound flights, and that collapsed almost the aviation uh, industry around the world. And we've seen um, high level of bankruptcies all over in the aviation. So leading airlines in the past have all uh, gone under as a result of this. So uh, back home here, domestically, um, the, uh, of course, the airline industries, uh, the associated businesses, the entire value chain seem to have collapsed. Uh, we've seen massive layoff uh, of uh, even pilots and um, you know, workers within that value chain. So it's been very difficult for the, the, the businesses operating in that industry, of course. The lifting of that ban, you know, uh, would mean some kind of a, a huge relief for them. But of course, we understand that aviation um, is a highly capital intensive, uh, uh, you know, uh, business. So um, uh, it is good that uh, they are coming back to business, uh, you know, but um, I think uh, the harm that has been inflicted by the pandemic is one that is going to be long lasting. So uh, it, it will actually require a massive investment by government to actually support them to continue operation, even now that uh, this uh, ban has been lifted. Uh, so it, it's not going to be very rosy for them because uh, given the depth at which they plunged as a result of a loss of revenue, and of course, uh, even when your, your, the, the aircraft um, were not uh, being utilized, they, they will still need to be serviced and kept, you know, uh, airworthy. So I, I think uh, that is where the challenge is going to come from uh, aviation, from businesses that have not made any uh, money in the past uh, five to six months now. So mm -hmm. it's actually taking a heavy toll on them and it's not just going to be very easy. But of course, yes, um, because of resumption of flights, we expect that uh, a little bit of business, uh, you know, uh, will begin to uh, pick up. Um, the projection is that we will see the aviation uh, industry begin to come back, uh, you know, normal, um, you know, three years from now. Mm, okay. You know, I was also going to come to that in the sense that what kind of pickup or recovery are you going to see? Because we've had... The lockdowns have been eased at least uh, since the last few weeks in Nigeria. And with the resumption now of uh, international flights into Nigeria, how do you see that the new normal which we're facing, because some consumers may now decide not to even travel anymore. You can just still sit in your office and do your board meetings or meet people. I'm speaking to you right now in Lagos. You don't need to come to Abuja to meet me. So how would things like this impact that airline industry? Are we still yes, going to uh, see the old normal coming back for that sector? No, um, it's it become obvious now uh, for every, for all and sundry that um, the, the the word of uh, let's say January 2020, February 2020 is a different epoch from the world in which we live today. So um, the new normal has come to stay. So it has been normalized. Uh, some businesses um, have uh, completely be, been disrupted, and the airline, the aviation industry is one of them. Uh, just as you rightly said, so there's going to be a huge, uh, because so many latencies that uh, people didn't even know of uh, in, in the last epoch have now been activated. So, and that has taken a huge chunk of the business of um, travel. Okay, uh, business travel, uh, most of that for meetings and all of that, so will definitely uh, reduce. But of course, having said that, uh, it's actually tax the innovative uh, cap capacities of the airlines, you know, to uh, you know find new ways of uh, keeping their businesses afloat. Uh, one of them would be with tourism, you know, uh, so uh, to grow the tourist uh, aspect of the of their business. 
because that's also a huge uh, chunk of the revenues that come to uh, the, the, the airlines uh, the, the, in, in the aviation industry. But when it comes to business travel, definitely that has taken an irrecoverable uh, turn. Mm. So how do you think that job losses in that sector should be handled? Uh, do you see more job losses? Do you see losses of jobs creeping up higher than it is right there? Because there was a time that a lot of pilots, many pilots were laid off. I think the government mediated and some came back. So, but you will agree with me that, you know, whether the sector likes it or not, some, jo some jo jobs would be lost. Yes, uh, definitely. Um, I, you know, I just read from you, you know, <laughs> your screen now that uh, France is unleashing 100 billion euro of, um, you know, support to their economy. So, um, it is important to save jobs, by the way. And the airline industry is a critical one. Um, it's very important, one of the critical infrastructure assets. Because one of the signals to a growing economy is the dynamism in the aviation industry. So um, once an economy is great, how you tell is the level of connectivity, interconnecting flights, you know, so you can look at all the metrics like available seats per kilometer or, you know, or revenue seat per kilometer and all of that. So when an economy is growing, those uh, indices also grow. So you can see that there is a direct correlation between those uh, indicators and economic growth. But um, so uh, but again, when the economy goes south, uh, the aviation industry is the first to go because it's kind of classified as uh, a highly elastic luxury component that people can always substitute. So because of that high elasticity, so once there is a recession, so it, it's affected immediately. And so they take a high brunt of that. So that is what we have uh, uh, experienced. But then we notice that um, there are crucial travels um, when it comes to transaction. We're talking about foreign direct investment. Um, no investor, because that's the bulk of uh, investment. In fact, the one that is transformative of the economy is the foreign direct investment. And the investors will have to fly it, okay? So um, you will still expect them to come. That means uh, whether we want it or not, we need to find a way to support the aviation industry, support the airlines. Uh, and of course, the, the federal government has done that uh, since 2009 when they did the $300 billion, uh, debenture uh, fund that was uh, warehoused by the Bank of Industries to support the airlines. But of course, we do not know uh, what has, what, whether that's really translated to improve performance in the aviation industry because we notice that here in Nigeria, there is this uh, tendency for airlines to quickly, um, you know, go out of business. So, in fact, uh, some analysts say that the, the longest that you can see an airline, the average number of years for an airline in Nigeria is about 10, 10 years, just years, a decade. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so about, about a decade. So the, that industry, even prior to the pandemic, uh, was not doing well. So for obvious reasons, uh, the costs are denominated uh, you know, in dollars. So uh, most, most of the resources utilized in that industry have to be imported. And then uh, we have little or, or no local capacity to really substitute within those industries. So that's part of our problem. Um, I expect that that will still persist, and then we are seeing the foreign exchange uh, uh, risk that they have to also confront in, in, in current times. And again, you know, the disappearing purchasing power mm -hmm. of consumers, because right now discretionary income has taken, uh, you know, a, a dive. So um, without government support, it's going to be difficult to really predict what will happen to that industry. Dr. Adi, let me get your own perspectives uh, with uh, on this barrage of economic data which we've had at least in the last four weeks and i'm specific about that last four weeks i see you smiling i think you know where i'm going to with the inflation of data course. yes the inflation data that was released by nbs at uh, 12.82 percent for uh, for july we also saw definitely the nbs releases the covid 19 monitor after that, the unemployment numbers came in at 27% unemployment rate uh, for the country. GDP numbers came in. The Nigeria's economy contracted 6.1%. Capital importation, the numbers were not looking good. Merchandise trade, the numbers not looking good. What's your perspective? One, the second aspect of that question is, 
take a look at it holistically. You're an economist. Is Nigeria in a recession? Remove the technically. Really? Is the economy in a recession? <laughs> You're smiling. I've got you there. I'm not talking technical because technically you tell me no after two quarters. But re in real terms, with all those numbers, are we in a recession? I'm stalking well, up something, but that's what it yeah, is. Yeah, Nancy. You know, recession is a technical <laughs> concept. It's a technical matter. And then you can't deal with it outside the technical defi definition of what a recession is. Okay, a recession is, an, is a technical economic term, and then we have to stick economics, yes. So uh, two quarters of negative G GDP growth. We are not yet there. We have one quarter of negative GDP growth right now. So of course, when you look at all, all around you, and then looking at the indicators you've, been, you, you've cited, uh, you don't need any fortune teller to of course, the big economies in the world are all in recession. Uh, we are only counting um, a negative 6% uh, loss or 7% on average. Uh, the UK is 20%. The United States is, uh, is more 22. than uh, 15%. Germany mm -hmm. is almost 20-something percent. So if the leading economies in the world are experiencing such a huge uh, slump, so who are we to really worry? Ours is just 6%. Even at that, I think... Uh, uh, that could be an under on, on on estimation because if you look at what is going really going on in the country, there is this new data that will be you know coming up uh, uh, um, you know uh, in a few days, which is the spread of uh, uh, poverty and misery in, or what they call not shared mm -hmm. prosperity. Some people are talking about government of shared prosperity, but what we are seeing is a government of shared and transmitted misery all over the the country. So. If you look at it, so the data shows that if you put, you know, the misery index, yeah. normally we, we compute the misery index using, you know, the sum of uh, interest mm -hmm. rates, um, mm -hmm. unemployment rates, um, and inflation, inflation, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, okay, so we subtract the GDP growth rate or add it depending, you know. So uh, now we can somehow modify that. So if you look at unemployment, okay, underemployment, inflation, okay, and, yeah. and, then, and then poverty. Okay, let's forget about the economic growth uh, because if you put it, it will even complicate matters, uh, you know. So, underemployment, unemployment, inflation rate, and poverty rate. Mm. So, if you put that together, that will give you some kind of a, of a, a miserable, uh, misery index, you know, uh, for, for Nigeria. And then when you look at this data, um, which is uh, state-specific, uh, state okay, so what you realize is that it's only... In in, in, in the southwest, okay, the, the, the states in the southwest, Lagos uh, leading the park, ocean states especially, that have done well. So they're blue, you know, in the sense that uh, they have po poverty levels below uh, 6%. And then when you do that composite index of misery, they are lower, you know, compared to other, other states in Nigeria. So if you go up north, you don't want to even talk about that. So go to northeast, it's all in the red, okay, with poverty levels that beyond what you can even begin to imagine of 80 percent inflation rate there is also higher than the national average so you have unemployment and underemployment and then the southeast as well with uh, states like Imo state leading that park okay has a huge concentration of unemployment and then when you have high unemployment what do you expect unemployment is a correlate of poverty okay so when you have high unemployment and higher underemployment the next thing you have is high poverty incident rates so that you have in this, that is what is happening in the southeast now. So you have southeast, you have the northeast, and the entire north. So if you look at the middle belt of Nigeria, that's where you, you know, Abuja, Nasarawa, and all of those places because of the spillover coming from Abuja, and then the spillover coming in from a little bit of the states. Okay, so you can see some bit of a narrow, you know, region that is not that poor, but of course they are poor. Okay, maybe not absolutely poor, but they are also relatively very poor. And then um, you know, so that's the narrow band. But generally, you see that there is a spread of misery all over Nigeria, which has not been um, helped by the lockdown and by the pandemic. Now, if you look at some data as well, for instance, uh, look at protein consumption. Uh, it's been flat in, in three years. So Nigerians have not increased their protein consumption because uh, cost of living keeps going up. Okay, um, it, Then their income keeps disappearing, dissipating income. So meat consumption is just 9 uh, kg per annum, the average, as against uh, Middle, Middle East and, and other parts of uh, Africa, that is 36 uh, kg. So you have something like uh, 
and you know the average nigerian consuming just eight liters of milk in a year mm. okay that's just being below poverty and then car owned automobile ownership is 19 per 1000 people okay that is very low of course we don't want um, more cars what we want will be you know transportation systems efficient transportation systems that work okay but we don't have this we don't have cars and then and, uh, this morning if you if you read business day so you will see that um housing estates in nigeria uh, in lagos are without infrastructure so they can do the little they can so if there is massive flooding you know around lagos or the major cities in nigeria except abuja okay many many households will go under so that's the kind of situation we find in nigeria um this is just a descriptive analysis i think uh, the situation is just bad now, with this situation bad and with the mixed re-index in Nigeria so high, uh, but it also depends on which state you are, just from your own analysis here, do you think that what the government has done, or do you think that the government is doing enough uh, to uh, suit the misery, or perhaps to even eliminate the misery that Nigerians are facing? Uh, earlier on, we showed the clips of when we went out, as Nigerians spoke to us, a lot of Nigerians are not happy with the uh, pump price of petrol that has increased, um, electricity tariffs, um, and a raise in, in, in electricity tariffs started September 1. So a lot of Nigerians are reeling from some of these economic issues. Do you think that the government is doing enough to ameliorate the situation of Nigerians? Hello, Dr. Adi, are you there? Hello? Yes. Okay, yes, I'm here. I, I lost you. Okay, did you hear my question? All right, let's... Uh, um, okay. That is nice word. Okay. Dr. Adi, go ahead if you can hear me. Okay, let's... let's no. quick Let's just take a break. When we come back, we'll try to reconnect with Dr. Adi. That we're still looking at the burning economic issues. Don't forget to join us on all our social media handles and send your comments. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. Dr. Adi is still with us. He is a lecturer at the Economics Department of Lagos Business School. Dr. Adi, just before uh, the break, I was asking if the government is doing enough to eliminate or ameliorate the misery that Nigerians are feeling right now. Nigerians have been feeling some kind of misery in the last few years, not just even about this administration. It seems that, you know, for every year by year, we just have one thing to say, which is not too good economically. Do you think that the government is doing enough uh, to ameliorate the misery of Nigerians? Well, um, 
um, it's a difficult question to answer um, because uh, you have to cons you know weigh a couple of uh, things. Okay. Um, now, if we compare Nigeria to other countries, all right, um, we can see that um, um, in every country in the world, um, this is a time government seems to be coming to the rescue of ordinary citizens. So, by way of uh, uh, se several palliatives, okay, uh, we've seen some countries where uh, people who have been out of work in the past uh, few uh, months have uh, you know been placed under some kind of government subsidy uh we've also seen businesses uh, highly subsidized we've seen government in some part of the world you know uh th this year kind of deferring tax payments uh electricity bills and things like that until when the things return to normal and people are able to take care of all these obligations uh, but unfortunately for us in Nigeria, um, this is also the time when we are seeing the implementation of uh, the cost, so-called cost-reflective tariff in electricity. Uh, we are also seeing the, you know, finally the government uh, moving in the direction of deregulation or liberalization of the downstream petroleum industry, the pricing of, uh, of uh, pr petroleum products. Okay, so when we put all this together, um, this is not the best time because when you talk about policies, okay, you also have to, you know, talk, uh, you know um, consider the sequencing of uh, policies, prioritization and sequencing, doing the right thing at the right time. So for me, um, yes, it liberalize the economy. Uh, it is imperative to liberalize the exchange rate. It's imperative to liberalize the downstream petroleum sector. Um, it is also very imperative to, you know, uh, deregulate the electricity uh, market, you know, such that uh, uh, consumers can get value for money. Yeah, so these are all very important uh, uh, priorities for government. But uh, the question to ask um, is, are we doing, carrying out those reforms at the right time? Are we implementing these policies at the right time? Of course, um, uh, we are all here. Uh, this is the wrong time, the very wrong time to implement these policies because people's income have come under pressure. Uh, so this is not the time to charge cost-reflective tariff. Um, actually, it, it is good to do these things, but we are doing them pursuing the, 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 the right things at the wrong time. And uh, as, as uh, you know, I don't know uh, what we'll expect. It will eventually have to be counterproductive. Because uh, the economy is really in a slump, and the only thing that can boost the economy, especially aggregate demand, would be it. okay. So once consumers are not spending, and, and then you can see that consumption spending power completely dissipated. So government is not doing anything to support that. Instead, uh, uh, consumers are coming under increasing pressure. So as that happens, you don't expect... Uh, things to improve, you know, even marginally in the short to medium term. Because uh, if you go, yes, we can see the PMI, purchasing manager, purchasing managers uh, index is still in the negative, okay, which is below 50. Uh, FBM purchasing managers index, okay, uh, is uh, positive, but again, not really uh, constant uh, showing, uh, 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 you know, some negative trend. So if we put all these things into consideration, uh, this is not the right time to embark on all these policies of uh, reform or deregulation. Okay. Um, Dr. Adi, so when will be the right time? For, the, for instance, we've been talking about removal of subsidy for years. And there was a resistance, I think, in 2012 or so. You know, so now, perhaps the government's uh, sense in terms of doing that is it's not buoyant enough to be able to keep the subsidies and why the petrol subsidies, that was why the petrol subsidies were removed. Um, when will be the right time? Because if government takes off subsidies, governments one way or the other would also need money to do some other things, a government that is challenged by COVID-19 pandemic. So that means that perhaps the sense of the government is also, we're taking our subsidies, but we're gonna raise revenues with other sectors and raising revenues from other sectors mean 
untold hardship on Nigerians too. I hope my viewers are getting the linkage of what I'm saying. Doctor, I know you understand what I'm saying. It's like well, you're removing subsidies yeah, and like taxes are getting increased. Yes. Uh, I get your point. You know, so um, let's look at it from an economic perspective. Uh, so we see now in what, uh, the shape of the policy environment anymore, uh, by the way. Um, if you let, let's again go to other countries and, and look at what they are doing, because you see misalignment. Government wants to, okay people who have money in the banking system, who have money in uh, savings accounts, you know, to bring out those monies to invest in the risk sector. And that is why they have reduced the uh, deposit rate to just 10% of the NPR. Okay, so which puts it at 1.2 or just 1%. So meaning that if you keep your money in the bank, okay, it's not the <laughs> uh, inflation rate. So it's better that you take it out and then put it somewhere else, you know, in some real assets, um, you know, real estate or do business with the money. So that's kind of incentive of encouragement that government has. That's a good policy. Then if you're encouraging people to invest and then you're not encouraging people to maybe uh, um, amass sufficient uh, 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 disposable income to, to spend on investment, don't forget that savings is equal to investment. So if people don't, uh, people don't spend, so you have a problem. That's a kind of misalignment. Okay? So, yes, government is doing the right thing. But we can't just say, yeah, we've been shouting ourselves hard so many years. The government needs to take itself out of the risk sector and allow private money to spend. Government is also creating 770,000 jobs. jobs yeah. Okay? So this is a government that doesn't have money. This is a government that is uh, finding money from people. So you, does it really add up for you? I don't know if it does add up for some people, but it doesn't add up for me. When is the right time for government? We've been waiting for them all these years. So government cannot always be reacting. That's what we're saying. Can we have some sort of objectives are and what government intention is? And then they can drive it through, okay, no matter what happens. So for in our case, uh, once the oil price bounces, so we, we, we you know, we, we get drunk on oil and then begin to do whatever we like, okay? Once we cannot do that again, then we now begin to uh, act as if we are pro-market, okay? So, but in, uh, in actual fact, it's being constructed a deliberate a policy step to revamp the economy. It shows that we'd be forced into that because you can no longer spend. Okay? So that is not, is that, do you think that's a way to, to, to run, even as an individual, is that a wrong way to run your family? You don't have no objective, you have no plan? I don't think it is. Okay. Um, Dr. Adi, your closing statement in just a few seconds, because we seem to be having challenges with your, with your video there, the network seems to be freezing. So in just 30 seconds, what are, what's your closing uh, remark? Okay, sorry about the quality. Mm. The, the network issues, such part of the infrastructure challenges that we, we talk about, you know. So um, low bandwidth, okay. Um, we have low bandwidth, uh, above 100, 100 megabytes per second or something. In Nigeria, we are still 3.5, 3.4 or something, and even sometimes get to one point something. So it can carry uh, voice, it can feed you. So it's also part of all those things uh, because we have deferred all the things that we should have done, and then uh, everything has been lost uh, under a bureaucratic bottleneck until the last minute when we can't do otherwise, then we now begin to react, you know, knee-jerk reactions here and there. So that's what we see. Now, government has alternatives also to raise money. There are so many government assets, assets lying fallow in many parts of the country that government can immediately privatize and realize some money without imposing all this hardship on people. Okay? Go around Lagos, you will see so many abandoned government uh, assets, okay? From federal secretary to old, and, and then army barracks that are located within towns that shouldn't be there. So. There are some government assets that need to be privatized and government to focus on 
derive some in, in, you know, sufficient resources to weather through this. If you look at what is going on in all parts of the world, what is happening in Nigeria is completely contradictory. Okay. Okay. So that is that is just the, 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 that's the reality. Okay. I think Dr. Adi will leave it at that today. Thank you very much for uh, joining me on the program. Thank you very much. All right, that's the much we can take. I've been speaking with Dr. Bongo, a lecturer, economics department, Lagos Business School. He's been giving us his perspectives about the burning economic issues. I know a lot of Nigerians are suffering right now, really, in, you know, like we said earlier, the misery index in Nigeria is, is high, but it's for the government to ameliorate the sufferings of Nigerians. I will see you all, God willing, Monday. I am Nancy Najibi, the best version of yourself. And don't forget to keep safe. Bye now. Thank you for watching our video. Please hit the subscribe button below, turn on post notification to follow all our updates.